Aerosmith, Sting, Brian Adams, Joe Bonamassa, what do these artists have in common? Not a whole lot, except that they were all smart enough to utilize the talents of our first speaker today. Um, he is a multi-instrumental artist, a songwriter in his own right, was a signed label artist, runs the gamut of skills in the industry. I'm really excited to see his program today because I know there's a lot of stuff he can talk about that relates to all the things that all of you guys do. So uh, without any further ado, join me in welcoming Mr. Russ Irwin. So I'm gonna, t I'll take you through my timeline, you know, of everything that's where I started and how I came to sit here today. Um, and really I started playing uh, when I was about seven or eight years old, <clears throat> and I was originally a drummer, actually. Um, and uh, one of the first things that was really instrumental in my learning was uh, I had an older brother who was really into music, and he was four years older than me. And um, he's a very talented drummer, and I wanted to be a drummer too, we were both drummers. We had a drum set in the house, we had a piano in the house, and we drove my mother crazy, right? Was loud. It was very loud, I can still hear her screaming from upstairs saying, I can't take this noise, stop! And, um, and so and my brother and I, we would, uh, my brother would turn me on to music, you know, when, you know before, he was, my, the thing about my brother that was really cool was that he, he, he found a way to find music that was great before anyone knew about it. Like, he would have been a great A&R guy. He would have been a great uh, producer or an A&R guy, right? So he was turning me on to music that I would have never been exposed to before. Um, <clears throat> and one of the first bands he, he turned me on to was Rush, okay? And so I was seven years old, seven, maybe t just turned eight, and... My parents bought us a drum set, and my brother, we put a, um, a record player next to the drum set, and we had headphones, and we would both play Rush, you know? Um, and, <clears throat> you know, and my brother was older, so he was bigger than me, so he, you know, we would have to fight for the drum set, right? You know? um, and this went on for a while until my mother couldn't take it anymore. She was like, you're gonna play the piano. <laughs> and I was, like, I was like, well, I don't wanna play the piano. Right? I didn't want to play the piano at first. And I, t I took some lessons and I, w I really wasn't, uh, I didn't really, I really wanted to stick with the drums, you know? And then, uh, so this is probably like 1976, right? 1977, yeah, I'm old. So, um, <clears throat> and uh, I remember my parents came home one night and they had just gone to see uh, a concert at the Nassau Coliseum. And my mom says to me, she's like, she's like, we just went to go see this guy and he was so great. And he was jumping on the piano and he was singing all these songs and you're gonna love him, right? And she hands me this album, um, The Stranger by Billy Joel. <clears throat> so, <laughs> and I was nine, right? And um, I fell in love with Billy Joel. And that was like a big turning point for me, um, you know, from Long Island. Um, I was, you know, on Long Island there wasn't really a whole lot of things to do back in the 70s. So like, you know, playing the drums and playing the piano was like a big deal, right? And it was, and me and my brother were kind of competitive, you know, so we, um, we pushed each other, you know, to get better at a really young age, you know? Um, and so I pretty much like went out and bought every Billy Joel record and just learned most of the songs and learned how to play them and sing them, right? So, by the time I'm like 10 years old, I'm playing like a dozen Rush songs on the drums and playing like 30 Billy Joel songs on the piano and singing them, right? Um, and, and there's actually a point. I'm actually gonna tell you that there's a reason why I'm telling you all this. It's not just to say, hey man, <clears throat> this is how cool I am. Um, but, so, and then when I was like about 12 years old, I went to this camp, I went to a performing arts camp, called French Woods. Uh, I don't know if any of you guys know that place, right? Um, but, and I went there with the intention of playing the piano. And when I got there, there was only one piano, and it was an upright, and it was just in shambles. It was like, most of the keys didn't work, and there was gum, and, the, and I was like, wow, you know, I'm like, I'm gonna be here for a few months. I don't have a piano to practice on. This sucks, you know? This is why I came here. And uh, so, somebody had a guitar, you know? 
uh, in the bunk that I was in. And I remember saying to the kid, I was like, you know, so, so explain to me, how does the guitar work, you know? And he said, oh, well, you know, it's just, this is the E string, this is the A, this is D, G, B. And he goes, and it just goes up chromatically. And I was like, oh, well, now I know how to play guitar because, I mean, I could see it on the piano. It was just, it was the same thing, right? And he showed me some chords. And within a few months, I was uh, playing these songs by my new favorite band, which was called The Police, that my brother had turned me on to, which is another band that I would have never, ever listened to. You know, it was 1980, right? And they weren't even that popular yet. Um, and we were also really into Led Zeppelin. Right? So classic rock was a huge part of um, where I come from, you know? Um, and it, it eventually became where I, I landed, you know, working with all these different artists who were classic rock artists. I didn't know that, that this wasn't intentional, it was just completely random. Um, but uh, so, at the end of that summer I was playing guitar and, um, and singing police songs and, and Zeppelin songs, right? So I'm playing Rush on the drums and I'm playing Pilato <laughs> on the piano and I'm playing all these other, you know, police and Zeppelin on the guitar. And that was kind of like the core of who I became as a musician, you know. And then and the next thing that happened that was pretty instrumental was uh, my parents were good enough to send me to the Berklee College of Music for a summer. And I was, it was before my uh, senior year of high school. And what was great about that was, well, there was a lot of things that were great about it, but one of the things that was great was I had really no context about how good I was, right? I didn't know. I, I like, you know, it was all just me in a room by myself, you know, for years, you know? Um, and when I got there, I started seeing guys who were like a lot better than me, you know, like in, all, in, in a lot of different ways. There was guys who were playing classical, there were guys who were playing jazz. And all of a sudden I got exposed to all these great musicians who were really kind of like my own age, you know? Um, and <clears throat> um, that was when I really was like, wow, you know, I can take this to a whole nother level. This isn't just about songs or an instrument or, you know, about uh, the bigger musical picture came into sight for me, you know? Um, and then and at the same time, my brother <laughs> turns me on to uh, Frank Zappa, yeah. who I really fell in love with. I didn't really understand him, you know, when I first started listening to it, I didn't really get it. And I think that it's really difficult to understand him. Um, but once you get it, it's, you know, it's pretty fascinating what an incredible genius he is, really. Um, and so, I, it kind of became like my mission to, I mean, granted, I was writing songs, and I, I kind of saw myself, like, you know, Elton John, Billy Joel, that was really what I, that's what I really wanted to do. But I also wanted to play in Frank Zappa's band. Like, you know, that was like my backup. I was like, you know, I was like, and so I decided that, um, I wanted to learn as much about music as possible. Um, and this, this kind of uh, ties into the whole, not only being a multi-instrumentalist, but being open to like learning lots of different styles of music. Um, because that's ultimately where I found my success. You know, the bulk of my success is, is in being you know, diversified and understanding lots of different types of music and not necessarily um, like, I'm not the best jazz piano player in the world, you know? Like, I'm really good. You know, I've studied it, and I, I really care about it. You know, for a while, I was a really good classical player. Um, I studied that for a few years. But ultimately, um, you know, working in pop music and rock music and learning songs and working with people like Sting and Aerosmith, um, you know, I didn't need to be the best jazz player, you know? It was actually better I, that I sang, you know? I ended up getting gigs because I was able to sing or play guitar or program or be able to play in lots of different styles, you know? My diversity became my strength, basically. So that's kind of why I'm, I'm tying all these things in, you know? Um, yes. and, you know? And I think a big part of um, developing and finding yourself as a musician is to know what you're good at, you know? Is to realize what your strengths are and focus on those things, you know? And, um, and I didn't know it till later, you know, um, when people started hiring me, and I, you know, that I realized that, like my voice, like the fact that I could sing really high and really strong in a, in a rock setting was really useful <laughs> to guys like 
Steven Tyler or Sting, you know. Um, and, you know, being a keyboard player, you know, I always wanted it to be about my keyboard playing, like, oh, look, you know, this, you know, I've worked so hard as a piano player, and then people were like, wow, you're a great singer, man. <laughs> I was like, oh, it sucks. You know? no, it didn't suck, but it was interesting, you know, um, that that's kind of how it ended up. And I think that that's like, that, that's a huge lesson in and of itself, is that, like, however I thought things should go, how my career should go, is usually not the way it went, you know? <clears throat> Um, so my intention really wasn't to be a side musician, you know, that, even though that's where I ended up. Um, but I've had success as a songwriter, you know, I've written songs for Aerosmith, I've written songs for Meatloaf and Foreigner, a lot of classic rock bands, because that's really where, you know, my, um, my heart is, you know, that's really where I, I find that <clears throat> um, I express myself best, you know. And, I, and those were the kind of musicians that I got along with the best, you know. Um, like, I never really felt comfortable as a jazz musician, you know? Um, even though I love it, and I still, to this day, practice it, and, uh, you know, and try to get... That's, that's kind of where I find myself um, trying to develop as a musician. Like, I, you know, I still practice jazz. Like, I don't, I'm not going to really learn anything that much from, like, learning a new Billy Joel song, <laughs> you know? Um, but even though I love doing that, you know, and pe that's what people want to hear, but I'm gonna, you know, learn more from, um, you know, transcribing a, a solo by a great piano player. Actually, that was another point I was gonna bring up, was uh, probably the best piano lesson I ever had was when I was at NYU. I had this, uh, this teacher, actually, I was taking some jazz lessons, and this, um, this I can't remember what, who it was, this teacher, but he said, um, I said, man, you know, I see you, you really want to do, you really want to learn how to play bebop. I was really into bebop, right? And he's like, but you know, he's like, and you're struggling with it, you know, like, because, you know, it wasn't part of, like, I didn't grow up listening to jazz, you know, at all. Um, but he said, uh, he said, you know, and another thing was, is jazz music musicians just are really horrible at explaining what they do. Have you guys noticed that? <laughs> like, they just, they're like, yeah, man, you know, if you just kind of like, if you get into, you know, just feel it, man. Like, you know, I'm like, what the hell does that mean? How, <laughs> how do you translate that into actually playing? Like, it, um, so there was kind of like this big mystique about jazz, particularly, like, oh, you know, you just kind of get it. You just have it. And, and now that I'm older, I realize that that's bullshit. You know? It really is. It's just, there's a lot of rules when it comes to jazz, you know, there's a lot of rules. Um, and I found that those guys couldn't explain themselves. But this one teacher said to me, he said, look, if you want to learn how to play, he said, transcribe. He said, because this way, um, whoever you're transcribing will become your teacher that day. So if you want Chick Corea to be your teacher, transcribe Chick Corea. And if you want, to, want Bud Powell to be your teacher this week, then transcribe Bud Powell. And if you want Miles Davis to be your teacher, then transcribe Miles Davis. And at, when he said that, I, I went on like a two-year spree of transcribing where I really pretty much didn't do anything but transcribe. And I had books and books of everything from, I mean, I, you know, I started with piano players and it was, you know, was McCoy Tanner and Chick and Herbie and all those guys. And then it was Coltrane and it was Miles. And, um, and then I even transcribed some guitar players, you know. Um, and that, that made a huge, huge difference in learning. And I think um, if there was, you know, one of the things that I would pass along to people if they want to, you know, just um, develop themselves as a musician is, is transcribing. That's probably one of the biggest... Um, things that I, I, that I really took advantage of, um, which was great. I was thinking like, you know, if I could give myself advice when I was, you know, a kid, what would I tell myself, you know? And one of the things I would have definitely done is, uh, I would have learned more about the business, you know? Because um, I think as musicians, we have a tendency to focus so much on the music that we forget to um, focus on you know, really how things work, where the money is, you know, with, with being on the road, publishing, you know, how publishing splits work, um, <clears throat> how management works, all this kind of stuff, how record companies work, really, or don't work anymore. Um, 
but um, you know that that would have, that would have been a big lesson for me. You know, it's, that I would have told myself, you know, make sure you have your business acumen together. Um, so anyway, give me some questions. Yeah, yeah. So I'm sorry. We're gonna. Oh, no. Okay, so I was just uh, going to ask you, like, if you could walk us through, you know, the process. So, like, Sting called, for yeah. instance, you got the gig. So, you know, I mean, he had Kenny Kirkland playing with him. Yeah. And this. So, you know, so you, now you got the call, you got the gig. What's your next step? So, it wasn't that simple, okay? Right. <laughs> um, so, <clears throat> I had just finished the Aerosmith gig, doing a first tour with them, which was, like, a little over two years. Um, and... Uh, <clears throat> a friend of mine, Chris Bodie, I don't know if you know who Chris Bodie is, he's a trumpet player. He was in Sting's band at the time. And he called me and he said, Do you, you know, would you be interested in being in Sting's band? And I said, of course I would, you know. <clears throat> um, he said, but here's the thing, is that, you know, uh, he needs a background singer who can maybe play some guitar. Um, and so, <clears throat> and I was like, you know, I was such a huge Sting fan that I was like, I don't care, I'll do it, you know. And I went and started, and I, I did the gig, and I was really mainly singing backgrounds, and, I, and then I was playing some guitar. And this is how a, a lot of people, you know, end up doing gigs, um, is that, you know, uh, Jason Rebello, there was two p keyboard players in Sting's band at the time. There was Kipper, who was mainly doing all the keyboards, and there was Jason Rebello, who was doing all the piano stuff. And Jason's a monster piano player. Um, and the way Jason got the gig was he was friends with Kenny Kirkland. And Kenny died on a, on a Sting tour, I'm pretty sure. Um, you know, uh, unfortunately, he overdosed on drugs. <clears throat> and, um, and Jason took his place, and we were in the middle of a Sting tour, and uh, Jason's father died. And they were in a bind, and um, they call, the tour manager called me up, and he said, look, you know, <clears throat> Jason's going home. We have a, a, a gig in two days in Japan and uh, we don't have a piano player. Um, can you do it? And I said, yeah, I can do it. So I had about 24 hours to learn the entire set <clears throat> um, and get on stage. And we did, a, uh, we did a sound check and we played three or four songs. And I had to like sit on the stage and like figure out the rig and all the program changes. And I had to learn all the parts since like about, about 24 hours and then got to get on a 15 hour flight to Japan. So there was no pressure. It was, it was, yeah, it was, well, the, the good thing about gigs like Aerosmith and Sting, particularly, is I already knew all the songs, you know, like, I, you know, those were already in my head since I was a kid, so it's a lot easier, actually, to learn those songs than to learn someone who isn't, you know, really a big artist, and you have to, like, learn 15 songs, like, I've never heard any of these songs before, that's actually harder, you know, but it was still a lot of pressure. <laughs> <laughs> Especially to get on stage and, and, you know, but I pulled it off and they were very happy about it and Sting kept me as the piano player for a while and um, Jason and I, we, we swapped back and forth. Um, but that was actually uh, a real, like, a moment for me personally as a musician because that was something, like, I didn't even know that Aerosmith had a keyboard player when, I, when they called me, you know. And I was, you know, I liked the band and I was a fan and stuff, but... Was, but getting the Sting gig was like, that was like a dream kind of gig, you know? And, and the fact that I, I nailed it was, was very satisfying, you know? It, it changed my confidence on a, in a huge way, you know? And that kind of, and that um, kind of found my, my confidence change in everything else I did after that, you know? That's sort of what I wanted to ask you. It's like, I think it might be helpful yeah. uh, since you just talked about prepping for tours like Aerosmith yeah. and Sting. And since the public conception of Aerosmith is that they're guitar driven, like you said, like oh. you didn't even realize there were yeah. keyboard parts mm -hmm. in the band. So preparing for the Aerosmith job, since you talked about that being the first big one. Right. So I think it would be helpful if you talked a yeah. little more detail about like how you prep for a rock tour as a piano player where it's yeah. a really twig guitar environment right. and what sort of parts, like knowing the songs as a, as a fan or as a listener is great, but yeah. really what's the process to drill down those keyboard parts to take a guitar driven band and make it work for you? And right. That's a good question. Um, so I'm going to answer that in a couple of different 
ways. So when I first got asked to audition for Aerosmith, um, the first thing I did was like buy all their records, right? And learn mainly, you know, really all their hit songs or the ones that were most well known. And I bought a video of them playing live and I wrote out the set list and I wrote out all the keys and I set up my keyboards. Um, so I had the piano down here and I had the, and the keyboard up here and I just learned, learned the shit out of the parts. You know, I just like, I spent like a month and that's all I did, you know, was play the song. So I was really prepared. I really learned all the parts, and, and not only did I learn the parts, but I programmed the sounds, mm -hmm. you know? Um, <clears throat> and, you know, I learned, and so when I went in, I, and I realized this later, because Steven said to me, he was like, he's like, man, he's like, I can't believe these guys, they come in here, and like, they don't even know the parts. Like, it's like, they just think that because they're talented, and they've had a few gigs before, that they'll come in and get, get the gig, just because, you know, they already have the Eagles gig, or something like that. But I went in there, and I just, like, I was like, I'm gonna nail this. So I got, and that's really, you know, I was really prepared. And plus, Steven and I sang great together. Like, we just had magic. As soon, and he, he knew it and I knew it. I was like, wow. That was actually an aha moment for me because I, to be honest with you, I never really thought of myself as that great of a singer. Um, but I sang great with him, you know? And, um, <clears throat> but as far as uh, Aerosmith being a guitar band, you know, it's a really sensitive, balance that you have to strike as a keyboard player, um, aside from the fact that guitar players just have a totally different ego, you know, but um, it's funny, Jonathan Cain was talking about being the glue, and, and that's, he was right, you know, that's kind of, um, I found myself, I, when I first started with Aerosmith, I didn't know how much I should play, you know, um, and what was interesting was, I actually thought I was going to be sitting out like a lot, you know, I didn't even know if, you know. But Stephen was just constantly like, dude, play, keep playing, you know, like, um, he's like, I want to hear that boogie woogie barrel house piano, I want to play the organ, but he's just, he wanted me to play on everything. So I, there ended up only, only being like one or two songs that I wouldn't play on, I'd maybe play so Shaker. So, yeah, I, you know, it was sort of, it would, it developed over time, it was, um, it could be anything from doubling the guitars, um, whether it was with strings or Hammond organ or piano. I mean, like, you know. You know what I mean? Like, literally, I mean, that's what I would play. Right? You guys know that song? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. And I'll tell you, man, actually, you know, uh, playing that part, like down low on the piano, actually really filled it in really nicely, actually. Um, the band didn't really take... Uh, was it primarily a lot of doubling that you're that just sort of, you're kind of just assuming... So it was that, numbers. it was that, and it was also like, uh, you know, there was a lot of, like, Stephen would just be like, you know... You know, like Mama Ken, like... Like, and um, we actually did a blues every night, you know, um, and they would give me a solo, right? Um, and this was actually a, a pretty big lesson was uh, when I first started taking the solo, like, you know, I was like, wow, you know, this is like my moment to like show the world how, how good I am <laughs> and how much I've practiced, you know? And, and I was like, you know, wow, you know? Uh, you know, like I was playing like jazz licks and, it was horrible, right? And, I, and Steven like pulled me aside like after a couple of weeks and he's like, dude, what the hell are you doing? I was like, I was like, what do you mean? He's like, he's like, he's like, no one cares how good you are. He's like, people are here to be entertained. He's like, he's like, put your foot on the piano, slam your arms on the piano and, and give people a show. People aren't here to walk out and go, wow, that keyboard player was really fantastic. He really knows how to play the blues, doesn't he? That's not what it was. It was... Right? And they really didn't care. So I had to um, switch my mindset, you know? And you're like, hey, every gig is totally different, right? With Sting, it was the opposite. It was like, hey, how good are you? You know? And, um, and that was a different 
uh, approach that I had to take because I just come off of playing with Aerosmith where I'm like, you know, and then like with Sammy, it was like, you know, we're playing jazz, right? All of a sudden, all of a sudden I had to fill Kenny Kirkland's shoes, which is not something that I'm gonna do, right? So, um, I realized actually that the best approach that I could take with the Sting gig was like the opposite. It was kind of like, just do what I'm good at. Like, not, I'm not gonna try to be Kenny Kirkland, I'm not even gonna try to be Jason. I'm just gonna do what, you know, what I feel comfortable with, you know, as close, and then, you know, fitting into the context of what it was. But I really was playing like funky solos, you know? It wasn't like I was playing all these crazy altered dominant, you know, the substitutions and like, you know. Um, I stayed away from that, you know? I just, I just kept it funky and simple and, and cool. And people liked it, you know? So, yeah. But with Aerosmith, it was, you know, always like about more is more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so the stylistic difference from Aerosmith to Sting, how did that change your approach to prepping? Oh, so prepping. Well, I didn't have any prep with, with Sting, right? I mean, except for that I had like, you know, a day to learn the stuff. So what, what, so <laughs> Yeah. How did you, you know, what was that process like for you? When you know you're, the, the pressure is on you. Like what, how did you put that set together that fast? I, I literally, um, you know, I had all the songs, I think, on an iPod at the time. And I, um, I literally just didn't sleep, you know? And I just kept playing the songs over and over again and learning the parts and breaking them down and taking notes on like, you know, when the sounds, you know, when, all was, when it was a, a string part, you know, when it was a, a Rhodes part, when it was a clav part, you know, and I had to be, you know, very meticulous because I didn't have very much time when I got to the gig and I sat at the, the rig and I was like, you know, where is the clav sound? You know, what, where, where, what is the range? Where's the middle C? You know, because sometimes they shift it. You know, sometimes the keyboard's split in half, you know, you're like, I, you know, um, I, so I'm like playing the, and there was, there was multiple keyboards too, right? It wasn't just what, it was like, there was a Hammond over here and there was a piano over here and there's a, you know, a whole rack over there. And so it was, um, that was actually probably the, uh, the tallest order in terms of like going on to a gig that I ever had, you know, was like, was doing the Sting gig in 24 hours. Well, so in terms of what you had to work with, uh, mm -hmm. are, you, are you putting that together from the record by ear, sort of figuring out yeah. parts, are they giving you any sort of... They gave back? me no... Nothing. Nothing. Charts, no nothing. Even nothing. when I started the gig, I remember, um, yeah, Sting basically said nothing to me. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was really fun, because Steven, like, won't shut up. You know, I was like... <laughs> it's like, yo, oh, man, you, you, you played the note like that. That's not the... Yeah, but kind of sounded kind of cool. Um, you know, with Sting, it was like uh, he didn't say anything for like, and I finally said to Chris, I was like, I was like, yo, man, I was like, dude, I'm like, am I, so what, am I gonna get fired? Like, what's going on? Like, he's like, oh, he hasn't said anything. He's like, that's great. <laughs> he's like, that means you're, you've got the gig, right? He hasn't fired you. Great. That's how you know he likes you. I know, right? English. <laughs> what do you want me to play? You know what? Okay. They want me to play. What do you want me to play? Because when I sit down at the piano, I normally just... I play the blues, you know? That's kind of like... That's where I find myself.
Yeah. That's where I find myself feeling the most comfortable. Are you writing? Um, you know, I'm always writing. So, and I have a group of writers, songwriters that I work with. Um, I made a record a few years ago, um, which actually was the record, it was called Get Me Home, and it was the record that I wanted to make when I was a kid. You know, I actually got to go back and kind of redeem myself, and, um, and that's a very live, actually, it's a very much a, a hardcore blues piano record. You know, songwriting, though, I sang and played and wrote other songs. Um, when you said you are producing, are you producing other artists? Are you producing, sending <clears throat> to other guys in nature? It, it changes, you know, so I'll... I'll work with different artists. Um, I also do a lot of commercials. Okay. Um, I produce and write music for commercials. And, um, and I've been getting more into film scoring, actually. Yeah, that's, yeah. That's, that's actually probably the thing that I, I'm focused the most on cool. now is, you know, I pretty much, I study film composers and I study scores. Cool. Um, in the back of my mind, when you start that process, do you start with piano? Do you start with lyrics? What's your process for writing? For writing a song? Um, so it used to be when I was younger that I, uh, it started with, with the piano, you know? And as I got older, um, it became more about the lyrics. Um, and, and not so much the lyric as much as the content or the idea or the concept of the song, you know? Um, I read, uh, there's this great book actually, if you want to learn about songwriting, um, that John Mayer actually turned me on to. It's called Writing Better Lyrics. I know, right? Really creative <laughs> title for a writer. But it's actually the, uh, it's the textbook for songwriting at Berkeley. Have you heard of that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it's by Pat Patterson. Um, it's a great book. It's incredible, actually. I bought this book while I was in the middle of making my album, and I was stuck on a few songs, on some of the lyrics, you know, I was really stuck, like it was holding up the record. You know, I wasn't gonna finish the record because I, I couldn't finish the lyrics. And, um, and I came across that book because of John and I read it and it completely opened me up. And I, it, it totally made my songwriting uh, just jump like three levels, you know? And so I would recommend that book. Um, there's three books actually I'd recommend. One is Kenny Werner, Effortless Mastery. Um, if you're a songwriter, I'd recommend that book. What's it Ready? Called? Effortless Mastery. It's a very, actually, it's really interesting. Um, but it's, he's, it's like a Buddhist approach to piano playing. Cool. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and he talks about, like, a, a lot about getting in the zone and getting past your fear and communicating with music through, without thinking, you know, getting beyond. Um, actually, one of the cooler points about the book was, he, he uh, says, you know, you shouldn't get on the bandstand unless you thoroughly know a song to the point where you don't have to think about it. Because once you get on the bandstand, you don't want to have to think about anything. You just want to be able to have it flow. So it's like the difference between practicing, you know, you can screw up all you want when you're practicing, right? You can like, you know, you learn the hell out of a song and make all the mistakes you want. But once you get in front of people, you want to forget you know, like, it's kind of like this, actually. I wrote all these notes today. I haven't really looked at them, but, you know. Um, but I wrote all these things down, you know, but I, actually, I didn't really want to, you know, I just wanted to, like, go with it, you know. Yeah. It's the same thing, cool. right? What was the third book? So the third book that I would read, and I'd probably read it more than once, is All You Need to Know About the Music Business by Donald Passman, which, um, <clears throat> and I, I, you know, I've read it more than once, and, you know, at, at different points in in my career, and I just think it's really important. You don't have to be the best <coughs> businessman, but you, you gotta pay attention to it, you know, at some point. You know, otherwise you're gonna get taken advantage of, you know, and you're just gonna be, um, I actually went back to UCLA in the extension program and took a, a law class in, um, in music publishing and copyright at some point, one point, because I just, you know, I wanted to be able to uh, read contracts and not, you know, and just know what the hell, and I didn't have to be the lawyer, I'm still gonna hire a lawyer, but I wanted to understand what, you know, really what was going on, you know? Um, and I think a lot of musicians miss that. And, um, and I think, and they get taken advantage of because of that, you know? And a lot of the music business is, is set up on musicians not knowing what they're talking about with the business. You know, we get in it and we like, 
we care about music so much and we, we have so much, you know, passion and energy, we want to, you know, make it or whatever, you know, whatever, you know, we have, we, and for them it's not about that, you know, it's about bottom line, you know, how do we make money off of this, you know, you know. It's actually, that was, that's another, probably the biggest and hardest lesson I think I had to learn is in all the years as being a musician is don't take things personally, um, especially business. You know, people will, you'll have success and people will tear you down, you'll be in the gutter, people will keep you down, you know. It doesn't necessarily mean anything, you know. It's really easy to beat yourself up, especially when you're a sensitive artist. Um, and I've done it, you know, a lot. I've, I've spent a lot of time where I've been like, shit, man. Do I suck? Like, what do I, do I keep going? Like, do, you know, only to find out that, you know, there were other things that I just couldn't see that would end up being really worthwhile, worth sticking it out, you know? And that's all I gotta say, unless somebody else wants to ask me. Is there one gig in your career that stands out the most to you? Like, Super Bowl? One actual performance? Yeah. Um, yeah, the, you know, <clears throat> well, was, if I had to say, there's, well, there's a few, actually. <laughs> um, but the one that probably sticks out the most is we played uh, with Sting in front of, in front of the pyramids. Wow. wow. Yeah. Wow. And so, and that was really cool because they like lit up the pyramids and that was very surreal because I was kind of like, um, like, wow, you know, this is pretty fucking cool. <laughs> 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 like, how the hell did I get here, man? Jesus. <laughs> and then, um, you know, uh, we played on the Grammys one, one year, and it was a complete disaster. Like, we actually had the entire rig go down right as the curtain was opening up. and So that was pretty memorable. <laughs> what did you do? Did you just fake it? Wow. Uh, what um, uh, no, we didn't really fake it. No, that wasn't really what happened. Are we, are, we, are we done? Um, we're, yes, we're kind of done. Okay. Join me and thank you for us. Wow. Thanks, guys. That was fun.